Miss Angela, what's going on? Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm glad that we can finally put this thing together. I know we've been trying to do it for a little while. Yeah, several months. Yeah. Really but, since last year sometimes. Since last year, but I took a break. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I took a little, some, what they call some battle group. That's right. But, uh, but no, we finally got together. I don't did a lot of interviews, right? A different stuff. I've never had, I never got a chance to do one about Craig. Okay. And I feel like it, it's time. Yeah. You know, uh, Craig is very important. I see a lot of people are starting to get more financial literate these days. It's like, I ain't say it's a trend, but it's like a movement. Right. That, that's right. going. So I feel like it was time for me to go ahead and put some content out there that could possibly help some people. Okay. You know, we drop a few gems on them about some things they didn't know. I'm going to definitely drop some gems. Since you are the credit expert. <laughs> So how long you been in the credit field? Well, actually, I my background originally is in finance. I okay. Was, I was a branch manager for Regions Bank and Hancock, Hancock Whitney Bank. Oh, okay. So I was in finance for about seven years. And so while I was a banker, um, you know, I did the loans and things of that nature. A lot of times when people would come in and get turned down, mm -hmm. I would give them, say, hey, let me tell you what you need to do, and then come back. So my mom, my dad passed away first. And then my mom was killed by a drunk driver seven months later. Oh, damn. And I said, okay, I can't do it anymore. I love banking. And I decided to flip it. So I decided to educate the people about credit and send them to the bank. Oh, okay. So I left the bank. And then, so now that's what I do. I've had my credit repair business uh, almost, I say a little bit over a year now, maybe a year and three months or so. Okay. Officially. Uh, but I've been helping people with credit while I was in banking for years. So for anybody that wants to start a credit repair business, there's certain certifications you yes. got to have? and mm -hmm. um, You don't have to, but I did. So I right. went through um, a company I call CCA, CCA um, and I was uh, certified as a credit consultant. Um, I also have spent a lot of money, um, but it's been well worth it on uh, education. Um, and that's why I've been successful with kind of helping my clients repair their credit um, as far as the dispute process, the laws. That's where it comes from, the laws. You have to learn the laws. Right. So, yeah, I was educating people about finances and credit when I was at the bank. But what I did was when I, while well, I was actually still working at the bank and after I left, and what I continued to do is educate myself on the laws because that's exactly how you get it done. A lot of people don't understand it. There's certain rights that they have as a consumer. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, let me give you an example. Let, let's go ahead and start. Like, say I'm a person, I have a 500 score. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the first thing I should do besides call you? <laughs> well, the first thing I tell people to do is this. You want to, you don't know, you can't come up with the roadmap, you can't come up with a plan if you don't know what's there. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you need to do is get some credit monitoring through, excuse me, my FICO, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, my favorite one is my FICO because my FICO, what a lot of people don't realize is it's different FICO scores. Right. So when you go to get a mortgage FICO score, mortgage use FICO 5, 4, and 2. You go to get to the bank, they're going to use either FICO 5, I mean uh, 8 or 9. Auto has a FICO score. Credit cards have a FICO score. So if you are trying to get a home, like with my clients, as I take them from step A to B. Well, H to Z, I'm sorry. We're getting their home. By the time they go to the mortgage loan officer or back to their realtor, I've already done the work. Well, they've done the work, but I've done the work as well. So we already know what their mortgage score is before I even send them away. So the first thing is this. pull your, Get some credit monitoring, pull your report, and look and see what's their negative. What's the reporting derogatory? Is it some things there that don't belong to you? Mm -hmm. Because you have people that have the same name as their father or their aunt or somebody and their information is reported on their credit. Or it's an account that should have been taken off your account three years ago, but they have a trick where they go update something called a date of last activity to keep it on your report. Right. So it doesn't fall off after seven years. So if you knew you had that old AT&T account 10 years ago, it has no business being on your report. But how would you know if it was on your report if you're not paying attention to your credit report? That's true. So the main thing is pull that credit report and examine everything that you see reported on there to make sure it's actually your information. So they should go to my FICO versus going to Credit Karma. Definitely <laughs> not Credit Karma. Credit Karma is not accurate. Now I'm going to tell you what they are good for. 
any removals or things that's added, that information is accurate. A lot of times, I will be honest, sometimes before it hits the credit bureau, some kind of way Credit Karma has it. But Credit Karma gives you an update on the credit score every week. That is not the way credit works. It's not updated every week. It's 30 to 45 days with a lot of companies. So I tell people, do not go by the credit score with Credit Karma. When I was in bank and I have people come in, oh, I got a 700 credit score, and they want to get a loan, and when we run it, it's high 500s. But they just looked at it on Credit Karma. Credit Karma wasn't correct. So do not go by Credit Karma. They use Vantage scores. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Vantage scores, like with my company, we use Vantage scores too. But I also track, I use the uh, Experian account, and I also track the FICO score. As long as I'm seeing points increase and things getting deleted, especially, especially what's on our action plan, then I know we're on the right path. Mm -hmm. But those most credit monitorings, except for maybe FICO, my FICO, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax and a few more, but most of them use Vantage scores. Right. So that's another thing. Make sure you're tracking your FICO scores as well. So is the difference between FICO scores and Vantage scores is the way that they're calculated? Yes. Or they're just two just two totally different? It's the way they're things. calculated. You right. go to a bank, they're not going to use a Vantage score. Uh -huh. So the, the, the score you want to pay attention to is the FICO score. Now, there's nothing wrong because, like I said, most credit monitors, that's what they use. As long as you see that score increasing and you see things getting removed, um, or updated, like let's say late payments again, reverse things of that nature. Then you are credit, you building credit, and you see that's reporting, and now you're getting positive payment history. You're on the right track, but don't just go by Vantage Schools. Also track FICO. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting with my 500. We we're, we're I'm in the credit monitoring now. So do I need to find a couple of credit cards that will accept me, or what? What do I do at this point? Everybody is different. Uh -huh. So. When I have, so I would recommend people to either rebuild or build credit because that's what you're getting um, credit cards for, right? First of all, with credit, you want to make sure you have a mixture of credit. Okay. So you want to make sure you have revolving accounts, installment loans, right? Mortgage loan if you eventually get a mortgage loan, um, things like that. Majority of your credit, though, needs to be a revolving account. Think about it like this. An installment loan is like a car note, something with a fixed rate, and it's, you know, you have a, uh, you pay your interest in the principal amount for a certain amount of years, and then it closes, right? Right. Imagine if that's all you had on your credit. You're not building enough history. If all of them, five years, they're going to close every five years, and you're starting back over. Versus a credit card, that's something that can grow with you 30, 40, 50 years, as long as you're using it so the company doesn't close it, um, and you don't close it, that credit just grows with you. Right? right. So most most revolving accounts. So that's going to be your store cards, JCP, any codes, Victoria's Secret, any store cards, and any type of major credit cards, Visa, American Express, Mastercard, Discover things of that nature. So with credit cards, if you're trying to build credit, you want to be strategic too. You want to be careful with the type of credit cards you get, especially if you're trying to build and rebuild credit. A lot of people run to Premier Bank. They run to Credit One. Uh, the dynasty court, some of those. Sometimes it's okay to start off with that, but I tell people this. I, one of the companies I always use, because they usually will give you some credit, is Capital One. Yeah, they will. For the personal side, Capital One. And they will let you do the pre-approval, right? Mm -hmm. So you go in, you click the pre-approval tab, you go on the credit cards, Capital One, click credit cards, go to pre-approval, see if I can get pre-approved. Click there, put your information in, and they usually show you a couple cards you may qualify for. So if you see Quicksilver 1, because it's two different Quicksilvers, if you see Quicksilver 1, Platinum, and then also Secured, I would say go for Quicksilver 1, right? Right. Um, and see if they approve you for that. If they say, no, you're just able to get a secured card, go ahead on and get it. At least start to build a history, right? Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go get three, four secured cards. That's a no-no. Because if you if think about it, if I'm a lender... And I'm looking at your credit file. See, people just think about the score. You need to look at your full file. The data. Yes, the data. So if I'm looking at your file and all your credit is secure, what, what am I telling the lender? That nobody will give you credit unless it's secure about your money. Right. Nobody, tr nobody, nobody trusts trusted me. Nobody you. There right. you go. Or something was going on with your credit at one point that that's the only thing that you could get. You see what I'm saying? Right. So I tell people, start with Capital One. And sometimes... Building maybe you start with Capital One and a secure card and maybe a secure loan if you don't have an installment loan reporting, right? And then or the secure card that I'm the other one I'm gonna tell you about is Discover, right? 
You do the yeah. same thing. Discover.com, credit cards, pre approval. Hit the pre approval link. If they only approve you for a secure card, go ahead and get it. Because the good thing why I love Discover, unless they've changed this recently, if you pay your payment on time for six months with that secure card, they will change it to a unsecured card. So you're not starting over. It goes from secure to unsecured. So you still building that history. And now you have a good quality credit card. That's an unsecured card. Now, so think about it. Now you got a Capital One unsecured. You got a Discover unsecured. You continue to pay that on time, right? And as your score increases, then you're able to get better major credit cards instead of First Premier Credit One and some of these other ones that what are they not call the best. subprime there cards. There you go, subprime cards. There you go. So say you do get the, the Credit One, the First Premier, mm -hmm. those cards. Would it be just a good idea to keep those maybe for a year just to build that history? And then once your score goes up, get rid of them because they, they, all of them carry those high annual rates. Mm -hmm. They charge you for credit limit increases. Mm -hmm. They charge you for paying the card. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend getting rid of them or just try to stay away from it if you if I would try to stay away from it if you have to. But if you've already done those cards, you had a history on it. And the thing, the thing about it, they tie you into that annual fee and they'll charge it every month. Right. You know, they'll break that $99 up, $8 a month here or there. Mm -hmm. The reason why I know that, because guess what? I had to start off the same way, not knowing, okay? Me Before too. I got in banking, <laughs> I didn't know about it. So I had the Premier, the Premier Bank card and the Credit One card, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Right? But then you go build three years of history. You don't want to get rid of all that good history you've had, right? So you end up just keeping the card. So it's best, if, especially for our children that are 18 to 24 that store in credit, start them off the right way. Think about it. I would rather get rid of a secure card versus a, a unsecured card. You see what I'm saying? It's secure, and I've already now built built some uh, unsecured, you know, um, credit with Capital One or Discover, things of that nature. I would just do that. And then that secure card, there's nothing wrong with it if you decide to keep one or two reporting on your credit. But me personally, after you've had that good payment history, maybe six months to a year, and your credit score increased, then you go and get some more cards, you know, better um, uh, credit cards. Yeah, high tier. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah high tier cards. I wouldn't even worry about about that because you you get to a 680, and then you can go apply for American Express. Yeah, that chase. Mm-hmm. Chase has one, uh, well, I was about to go to business credit. Chase has some, and so it just depends on your bank, too. It's part of the problem. I mean, part of the solution as well is making sure you have a relationship with a bank. Because right. if you had a relationship with a bank, they'll give you some a card anyway. So let's say you go to Regions Bank, and I'm talking about Regions because I came from Regions, so I know okay. their products front and, then, and back. And then we have one here in Shreveport, Correct. too, so that works. Okay. They have several several different branches all over Shreveport, uh, Bolger, all over. Different places. Right. right. So with them, let's say you start with a secure card with them for six months, and then your score is where it needs to be, and you've built some credit over here or even a year. You don't think they're going to turn around and give you an unsecured card because you've built that relationship. So now you may have a checking account over there, and you have your direct deposit going there, and you've opened up a savings account, and your credit score is where it needs to be in your credit. Why would they not give you a credit card? So it's not about all the time, too, just going to the Discovers, the American Express, things of that nature, which I love an American Express card. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> also it's your bank. Your banks have great cards. A lot of times they have great interest rates as well. So that's another way. I know what you mean about the relationship because I built one with Navy Federal. Oh. And, and, and Navy Federal, I, I did uh, <laughs> a partial direct deposit. I didn't do my full direct, but I did mm -hmm. start direct, direct deposit. Uh, I did get a card with them, and I did get a pledge loan with them mm -hmm. just to build yep. that relationship. Mm -hmm. And now they gave me an American Express. and mm -hmm. So I understand yep. about building that relationship because yep. Navy Federal is all about relationships. So. And let me tell you, Navy Federal is one of the best credit cards you can get. And the reason why I'm going to tell you is this, is building a relationship with them if you can. You know, you have to know somebody that's been in the military or a right. family member or somebody. You know, I have an account with Navy Federal as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they give high-limit credit cards. Oh, yeah. They give high-limit credit cards. So, you know, what I do want you to know is this, though. So, I'm going to give y'all a little free tea, okay? Let's go. And this is for business credit as well. So with American Express, once you're in their family, right, any other cards you get with them, it's a soft hit. Sure is. And that's if you're getting business credit cards or personal credit cards. But do you have anything outside of the Navy Federal? Because 
if you go to Navy Federal, because um, Amazon has one too through American Express, but it's through them. I don't know if that qualifies for the South Pool. You see what I'm saying? Right. Versus you going directly through American Express and getting a platinum card or the blue card or the cash card, the gold card, things of that nature, or the airline card, the Hilton card. You know, so think about that as well. But I love American Express because once you get it, it's a think about it. You go get another credit card here and another one there. And I'm talking about business because you don't want to just be piling up credit cards on your credit. I mean, you don't have to uh, worry about your credit getting hit. That's how you build up business credit as well. Exactly. Without running that credit. I mean, you know, without having that credit report, those anchors reporting on your credit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about something else that, uh, that plagues people. Collections and charge-offs. <laughs> okay. Say I got a collection. Mm -hmm. Some people say pay it. Some people say don't pay it. Mm -hmm. So which one is it? Do you pay it? Or do you not pay it? So let me tell you my answers to my clients. Okay. Don't pay it. Don't pay it. If you decide, you owe the debt, okay? Right. If you decide to pay it, don't pay it until it's removed from your credit. What people fail to realize is the Fair Credit Report Act says, as a consumer, you're able to, if you see any inaccuracies reporting on your credit, you're able to dispute them, right? Right. Also, if you dispute something that to, with a creditor, collection agency, uh, debt collector, they have to verify the debt. If they're not able to verify the debt, that they have to delete it, right? Right. So that's how you're able to get things removed off your credit, whether you owe it or not, because what you're disputing is the inaccuracies reporting. Not you don't go in for an account you always say it's not my account. You don't do that, okay? So that's how you're able to get it removed. So if you decide at that point after it's removed, okay, I'll go ahead on and pay it or sell it and pay it, that's the way you want to do it. Now, there is something called pay for delete. Now, you don't want to call the companies and say pay for delete because they're going to say, okay, you're a credit repair company, you didn't talk to somebody. But basically, you're calling the company, you're saying, hey, if I pay this percentage of this debt or if I pay the balance on this debt, would you delete it off my report? If they say yes, say, okay, can you send me a letter saying that and then I'll pay? Some of them will. Some of them will say, no, if you pay, then we'll send the letter. That's fine, right? And then what happens is they delete it off your report. But it's, some of them will and some of them will not because there's some collection agencies that I know or, or even like uh, Capital One, um, you know, some of them, like those, those when you're dealing with the actual creditor, sometimes, a lot of times, they will not. Some of them will, some won't. But with the collection agencies, you have more of a chance of them deleting it off your report. Right. But never admit the debt. They have you on a call that is recorded. So the way the conversation should go is, hey, I was looking over my report. I see an account here that's reported. I'm not familiar with it. If I pay this amount, will you boom, boom, boom? You see what I'm saying? Okay. That's the way to do that. Because if you call on there, yeah, I owe the money, and this and that, they got you on the call saying you owe the money. Or oh, I did this, or you know, you are saying I, I, I. They got you on the recorded call and into the debt. Right. You know, so that's the way the conversation should go. I was told that you only pay if you want to repair the relationship with the company that you didn't pay. Right. Or you just burn or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if it was American Express. Right. Like you might want this relationship again. So mm -hmm. it's best to pay it or work it out before it gets to collection. If you there you go. Yes. Try to work it out. I just had a client today. We had a consultation. And she is four months behind on her credit card payments. She just had some medical problems. She had a tough year. I said, you need to call the companies. And a lot of them will try to work with you. I said, try to work this out, get this fixed before this turns into a charge off account. Because you had 150 days. Once it hits 180, it's going to charge off. Right. So I told her that, you know, a lot of times people are scared to call, but they usually want to work with you. They want your money because they want your, the money you're paying for interest and everything else. Right. Especially with COVID going on, a lot of times if you call them and you've got a late payment, you say, hey, I got COVID, things of that nature, sometimes they reverse their late payment. I've had clients, I say call because I know some of the ones that we're and they do it. Or you can actually, so here's another gem. You can, if Capital One is good for this, you write the CEO and tell them that you, you know, come up with a nice letter and ask them to reverse their late payment. You'll get it, or you can email them as well. A lot of times they'll go in and reverse their late payment charge. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there's a free gem for you. There's another one. So what you was told was not correct. 
Because let me tell you why. Okay. Let's, just because it, that debt is removed off your credit, technically you still owe it. That doesn't mean they can't, they can't stop them from suing you. Something called statute of limitations for the debt. Mm -hmm. So they have up until a certain amount of years where they can sue you and get paid back for the money that you owe them. So that's not true. Now, nine times out of ten, if they know what they're doing disputing, you are disputing asking them to verify certain information. If they can't verify it, they have to delete it, right? So if they can't verify it nine times out of ten, they're not going to come to you, try to sue you, because they can't verify it at the, in, in the court, you know, with, if it, in front of a judge. They can't verify that information. So normally that's what will happen. They don't come after you, right? Especially a lot of these hospital bills, because a lot of times that's just errors. Uh, where people should have uh, co-pays that maybe should have been paid by something else or the right uh, code wasn't uh, inputted in the system and um, it had them owing and they really didn't, you know. And a lot of times the people are not even getting the bills and they say they know medical bills popping up on their report. But, no, you still owe the debt and it's a statute of limitations. So don't have that mindset right. because it can happen, right? right? I'm not telling you to seek to pay it. But that's not true. I understand. Mm -hmm. Judgments. Mm -hmm. Man comes to the door, gives you the paper. Mm -hmm. No way around them, right? That's just something that you just have to pay. Not true. Okay. Because if you've been disputing your credit uh -huh. and you've done a certain flow, that's why sometimes I tell people, run from the people that say they're going to fix your credit in 30 to 45 days. <laughs> it's not true. Okay? Yeah. They're doing probably a credit suite where they're, you know, telling, you know, um, a lie, I hate to say a lie on camera, but basically what they're saying is that none of this information is yours, it was fraud, right? And now the credit bureaus have caught wind of that, so now you have to do get a notarized uh, letter and a police report to prove that that was fraud, to stop these credit sweeps, because that's all they was doing, was going in saying everything was fraudulent and then clearing the people's report, and then starting them over from scratch getting them credit. That's what was happening. So that's how they was able to get you results in 30 to 45 days. But real credit repair, it's a process. And if somebody knows what they're doing, it's a dispute process, it's a dispute flow. So I dispute to litigate. What that means is this. If any of my clients are, while they're in the process of being with me, whatever happens before, that's not, you know, uh, not anything that I can, you know, handle. But, well, I can still re, uh, re um, the word don't want to come out of my mouth. Come on, word. Refer them to a consumer attorney that can assist them, right? Right. Um, but um, as far as, um, I done lost my train of thought. Come on, help me. Come on, help me, Jeff. We were talking about judgments. Judgments. So at the end of the day, um, if you are following a certain dispute flow, which means you're asking for verification. Right. You're asking for this, and they never send it. You can take that when you go to court and say, I asked them on this date with a certified letter. I asked them on this date. I asked them on this date. They weren't able to provide me anything. Right? Right. So just because you owe the debt, you can still go to court and win. Okay. It's about knowing what you're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know we touched on collections and we touched on judgments. Charge-offs, mm -hmm. and you had mentioned before, of course, when it goes past 180 days without a payment, mm -hmm. it normally goes in charge-off status. Mm -hmm. So what can you do about that at that point? It, you can dispute it. Dispute same way. Mm -hmm. Don't pay it. Mm -hmm. It's or something else? called factual disputing. Right. So what happens with factual disputing is that's why I said I'm inaccuracies. You're oh. using a fair credit report in that. Basically saying if it's something reported inaccurate, so you are, you are writing letters to the credit bureau saying this is inaccurate, this is inaccurate, or experience saying this, transgender saying this, experience saying this, this information is, is inaccurate, please remove it from my report. And that's how you're able to get them accounts deleted off because they're not reporting them accurately. So unless that creditor still, you know, comes to you and say, um, we're going to take you to court for the money, I mean, you don't have nothing to worry about. Let's just say we dispute and we dispute, dispute. Mm -hmm. Stuff just ain't coming off. Mm -hmm. At that point, do you just wait the seven years till it drops off? or What, what do you do at that point? You, you know you want to buy a house. You mm -hmm. want to start establishing credit. But you got these negative items that mm -hmm. just won't come off. Right. I mean, what can you do at that point? 
Well, this is what I tell people to do, what I strategize with my own clients, okay? Okay. So with charge jobs, what people fail to realize, for the most part, they don't really affect you getting a mortgage. The collections do. Oh. Now, but let's say you have a charged off repossession that's different. Then okay. you have to add that back into your debt. Now, I'm not a mortgage loan officer, so I put that out there. Right. I'm going by my experience. By your experience. It's the collections that hurt you. Not the collection. I mean, the charge offs as much. Now, if you want to clear your file and get your score up, that helps. Yeah. But you know, it's it's so much to a credit file that can get that score up besides just that charge off. You know, as far as making sure you have enough credit reporting, making sure you're paying your bills on time and removing all the negative as far as the collections or most of it. You know, sometimes you dispute, 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 and then you can't. At that point, then you may want to negotiate, right? Right. You need to negotiate that and ask them for a pay for delete, what I talked about. So right. you pay it when they delete it, right? Because this is what a lot of people do. And I say I'm going to do a live about this. People get ready to get tax money. Some of them have already gotten it. And they go take their tax money and pay all this stuff off, right? Mm. Your credit score don't go up that high. And it still stays on your report. For seven more years because once you pay it, the day the last activity is updated and it stays on your report for another seven years. So it's going to up the paper status, is going to update the pay, but it's still going to say charge, uh, the payment is going to show from, um, from, um, um, to pay, the payment status is going to show pay, right? right? But under here, it's still going to show collections charge off or charge off, whatever it is. That's not going to go anywhere. That's what drives the score, the algorithm, that right there. That's why you go try to get it deleted. Okay. Because if the full account is gone, that's when the algorithm of your score is updated. Right. Mm -hmm. So it still stays derogatory. Mm -hmm. You know, updated the last activity. Mm -hmm. So you don't refresh the seven years. Yep. And you out of thousands of dollars. Yep. Just for it to say paid. Mm -hmm. When you could have spent that money on credit repair and got it repaired. And, and could have more than likely got deleted. Mm-hmm. I'd be dumb. Or at least just made the call. Because right. they may not, it may be a $500 bill and they let you pay $200. Yeah, like. And still delete it. There you go. Because you can call Sam or Pay. They're not going to tell you that we can delete it. You ask the question, hey, if I pay this, will you delete it and make sure you get it in writing? Because if they don't delete it, because sometimes I've seen it happen, you got that letter, you can send it to the credit bureaus with a dispute letter and let the credit bureaus take it off. And I'm not paying the full amount. There you go. It's almost like paying the, the car price. There you go. Paying the, mm -hmm. <laughs> what they call the sucker price, the sticker right, price. Right, And And in the round tax season, you're going to be getting letters, 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 letters. If you can pay us three payments of da-da-da, we'll take it off. Or if you, if you owe us 10000 but we'll take 4000 because they know it's tax season. Right. So you, a lot of people, now that's when them letters really start moving and coming in. Mm -hmm. Is it true that they say if you... If you want to pay a collection to pay it towards the end of the month versus the beginning of the month. Because mm -mm. you hear all these, you know, yeah, all these yeah. little rules. All these myths. All these myths, right. It doesn't matter because some of them may delete it off within 30 days, some and maybe 45. Mm -hmm. uh, even with child support to update, I've seen, it take, it, I've seen it take 90 days. You know, so it just depends. You know, it doesn't matter when you pay it. Like, what, what are the hardest things to get off? Like, what, bankruptcies? Bankruptcies, and that's the things I charge more for. The things that I charge more for: okay. bankruptcies, foreclosures, uh, child support, mm. and uh, repossessions. Because with the repossessions and bankruptcies, not only am I reporting it through the credit bureaus, I'm also reporting it through secondary bureaus. So I'm looking for errors as far as with bankruptcies. I'm looking for errors on the court documents, all of that. I'm looking for inaccuracies to get that off. Right. And it's the same thing with the repossessions. It's a flow that whenever the car is repossessed, that it's a step-by-step -step process that the that, uh, company is supposed to take. If they don't and you catch them in there or they reporting the wrong balance because gap insurance paid for something, that's what a lot of people don't realize. They repo your car. If you got gap insurance, they send them money. So, or, and also if they sell the vehicle, right, that balance that they say that you owe is supposed to be reduced by, uh, they're supposed to subtract what gap paid, they're also supposed to re uh, subtract what they sold the car for, and that's what you're supposed to owe. Right. So if you catch that up and see that they're not reporting that accurate, that's an accuracy, and that's a way to get it removed as well. Mm. So you got me giving you free game out here. <laughs> can, you, can you explain... Paying by the statement date versus paying mm -hmm. on the due date and what that does to your score. I sure can. So with credit cards, the statement date or billing cycle date, 
whatever that date is, whatever that balance is on that date, that's what's reported to the credit bureaus. You don't wait to that date to make the payment because with credit cards, it usually takes a couple of days for the payment to post. Right. So I tip my clients at least three days before make the payment. And the reason why I say three days because a lot of the credit card companies have a cutoff time as well. Right. Like five o'clock, six o'clock. So you may say, okay, I'm going to pay it on Tuesday, but it's really Wednesday because you paid it at six o'clock. You see what I'm saying? So to give yourself leeway, I tell my clients pay it at least three days before that date if that's, excuse me, if you're going to use that process, okay? Um, and what happens is, so let's say you pay it down to zero, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Then that's what will be reported to the credit bureaus. After that, you, the next day, you can turn around and go spend whatever again, do the same thing. Because it's already been because that zero balance has already been reported to, to the, the credit, credit bureaus. bureaus. Mm -hmm. So you wait for it to report or it's zero. Right. Go ahead. There you go. As long as you got a plan to pay it down before there that next go. statement day. Right. But this is my thing about that. Life happens. Yes. It right. So life happens and you're doing that. To me, the only time I would tell my client, because I'm about um, using finances and credit in a, a positive way. Right. And I'm not saying it's not a positive way. I mean, where it's not stressing you out. Because if you got five or six credit cards, you're trying to keep up with them dates and this, this, and that, and make sure I pay because I don't want it to hit and you stressed out because you didn't pay about it, you know, the date, the web report. Just keep your utilization low. That's why you want high limit credit cards. And that's just something you have to build up over time, especially if you're first building credit. Right. So I tell my clients, especially because they're just getting started with learning how to use credit. You're going to hear people say all the time, keep it down to 30%. 30%. But what if interest hits? You're going to go over 30%. Now you're at 32, 31. Right. So I tell my clients 25%. I teach them how to calculate that utilization, which you just divide. You take the limit and multiply it times whatever percentage you want to use, and that's the amount. So 500 times 25%, that's $125. So that means you don't want your balance to go more than 125 Now, if you want to maximize your credit score... 10%, excuse me, 10% or less is what you need to be. Okay. Don't go under 1%. So between that window, if you want to maximize your score and get uh, most of the points for that, for your utilization, 10% or less is what you need to be. So for the ideal maximum score, mm -hmm. you want to go to at least 1%. You, I'm not going to even say that. Between 10%, you just don't fall under 1%. As long as you're in that window between 10 and don't go under 1%, you're going to maximize your score. Because okay. under 1% is zero. Yeah, there you go. So you want to leave a little, a little bit, bit. a little bit on And it's there. not hurting you, but it's better if you, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm going to just pay all that off. But it's actually better if you keep a little bit of uh, a percentage credit utilization the, on there. Because the bank's like, he has a balance. And he's using I it. I can make a little bit of money right. and he's using the card. Correct. So that maximizes your score. Right. Even though you could pay it down to zero, which mm -hmm. is fine, mm -hmm. but to have the optimal maximum score Correct. between 10 and 1%. Correct. Don't go under 1%. And, and, and try your damnness not to go over 30. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, life happens. If you just got to, if you can only keep it at 30, fine. Just make sure you keep it down to 30%, you know? But like I said, with my clients, our number is 25 or 10% to 1%. Mm -hmm. So, what are your, what's on your good credit cards list? What, what cards are on that list, on the good ones to have, if you can get them? American Express. Right. Navy Federal. Yeah. Um, even Capital One for people, because if you're trying to build credit, Capital One is one of those companies that will give you that card. They, I've seen people in low fives, mid fives, they get credit. They will give you a chance. Yeah. They even if it's three the hell out of you. But. Yeah. They're going to go through all three credit, credit bureaus. But <laughs> yeah. now some of them, though, like if, I, I want to say with the pre-approval link, and don't quote me on this because it was like that, that it would be a soft hit if you use the pre-approval link, though. Don't mm. just go in, in, and go in for it and just say, I'm going to go apply for Quicksilver. Use the pre-approval link. Just to even see if you yes. even qualify. Right. So don't quote me on that because I haven't checked on that this year. So don't quote me they, on that, but you can call Capital One they, for yourself. They still have the pre-approval link because I like to just have working they knowledge do. and stuff. They do. Discover does. Mm -hmm. Chase don't. Not anymore. They City don't. Citibank. Citibank is I think another they one. They still got one. Yep, they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So City's a good one. Yep. So I had a client. She got a secure call with them last week. Mm -hmm. um, City's another good one. Um, your bank. I mean, I got a credit card with a Nika Federal Credit Union, and my interest rate like nine percent. Right. 
For a credit card, matter of fact, maybe lower than nine percent. For a credit card, that's low. Most of them are double digits. Oh, nine percent. Yeah, you know. So yeah. check with your bank. Yeah. As well, because guess what? Not only are you um, you getting the credit that you need, you also that's part of the relationship. relationship. That's part of the relationship. The relationship goes a long way. When I used to do loans at the bank, they look at that. So that may qualify you for a lower interest rate on a loan or anything because they'll say, oh, they've been a customer of ours for this amount of years or they got this many products or this, this, and that. And you'll qualify for a lower interest rate because you're a relation, because you already have a relationship with the bank. Yeah. Banks, you know, you want a relationship with the bank. So it's also good to get credit cards and stuff right with your bank. It's true. Because mm -hmm. I got USAA. Mm-hmm. That's got, another good one. I got Barksdale Fed. I got a few because I used each bank for different things. Right. But I've done had at least all of them for at least a few years. Except for right. Neighbor Federal. I'm a little bit newer there. But I, I love I, I love Neighbor But Federal. I ain't come close to crossing <laughs> them. I, I love them. Because then they let me add my daughter on as an authorized right. user. They didn't, oh. have, they didn't have an age limit. Yep. Which that helps, of course, as you know. Help the children build yep. credit. So when they turn 18, right. still, Dad, can you co-sign for me? You don't need no co-sign. Right. You got your own score. Let's talk about authorized users because I love that you said that. Oh, yeah. So authorized users. I love the way Jeff is using it to build his daughter's credit. You want to call the company to see what's the age limit. Some of them don't have it. Some of them may be 10 years. Some may be 8, maybe 13. Um, I have a list at home saved on a drive. But that's too many for me to be trying to remember. Um, so you can always call the company yourself. Okay. Now, trade lines. Mm. You have people selling trade lines to people when you pay $600, you know, whatever, depending on what's the limit on the card and the balance, how long they've had it. That's the more you pay for it, for you to be added as an authorized user to somebody's card. Y'all, that's almost slightly legal. Not just that, it's temporary. I don't believe in temporary fixes for credit. You know, nobody's going to let you be on their credit card forever. So mm -hmm. you're on there for three years, three months maybe, maybe six months, and they're cracking down on it too where they get to the point where they're trying to make it where it can only be intermediate family only, okay, because they know what's going on with the trade lines. They've been watching it. So be careful with that. And also another thing is this. When you're going to go try to, let's say a lot of people do this when they're trying to get set up to get a house or they're just trying to build credit. They'll go and get on their mama's five credit cards, right? Yeah. And build their credit, but they haven't built any credit for themselves. So if I'm a lender and I look at your credit and everything is authorized user, then that's not that's not good. I don't even know if you have the ability to pay. Right. You based off somebody oh, yeah. else's card. Right. So not just that. You don't want to be 20 years old on all mama cards, haven't started building anything for yourself. Then mom pass away, then what? You haven't built any credit for yourself. So you all, it's okay to start, use that to build, but also take them scores and then start building your own. Oh. That's the way to do that. But I do love the fact of using it for your children to build them credit. I have a 24-year-old, a 23-year-old, and an 18-year-old. The, the 23-year-old and the 24-year-old all over 700 credit score, right? I started with them when they were 16 years old. But um, not the 24-year-old, he did, he built his own credit out. But my other two, they're on mine, right? Plus my... 23 year old has also built his own. So it makes a difference. When they're 18 years old, they've already built credit. And we need to get our kids used to not thinking when they get out on their own, they got to go get an apartment. Why? Apartments these days cost just as much as a mortgage. If you've helped them build their credit, they can go ahead and get their first starter home and pay a mortgage versus an apartment. So they already been in equity in a home with their name on it at 21 years old, at 20 years old, at 19. Because some of these kids get a job when they're 16 years old and been working and can be building credit. And by the time they're 18, 20 years old, who's to say they can't get their own house? Yeah. Or they go to college, right, and they've been building credit. And then guess what? By the time they're 20 years old, they're in their sophomore or junior year, they decide they don't want to stay at the dorm. They go buy a duplex. They stay on one side, they become an owner, a business owner, right? And yeah. then they are renting out the other side. Now you've made your child a business owner at 20 years old. That's the way we need to be leveraging credit. I like that. That's the way we need to be leveraging it. I do want to touch on business credit, but I, I want to hit on this one thing, one okay. more thing about the personal credit. Code. Okay. We go about personal credit all day, but I think we hit on a lot of topics that people wondered about. 
And I want to hit on credit limits mm -hmm. because I know credit limits are important, especially when you're trying to get high limits and mm -hmm. high tier cars. Mm -hmm. That you just can't have a three hundred dollar Capital One, right? A five hundred dollar Navy Federal, mm -hmm. a thousand uh, dollar USAA, mm -hmm. and then go to Navy Federal and try to get twenty five thousand right. dollars. Because the banks were like, "Well, if they ain't give him but thousand, right. and they ain't give him but three hundred, go." I don't know if he can handle twenty five thousand. Right. They only giving him the limits right. for a reason. So, what, what's the best way to go about raising their credit credit limit? You either gonna have to slowly do it over time, uh -huh. which means you use those cards, you know, pay them on time, keep the balances low, which means you're not maxing it out, maxing it out, maxing it out, and you know, every six months to a year, request an increase. Ask them because you do not have to have an increase every time you increase it. Just ask and say, hey, I want to see if I'm able to get an increase without you, with you doing a soft hit, right? Right. A soft inquiry, right, on my report. Um, that's how you do that. And then next thing you know, you're up several thousands of dollars, right? Your limit is higher. Or mm -hmm. we talked about authorized user cards. Be strategic. If your mama have a $15,000 credit card, yeah, you want to be added as an authorized mm -hmm. user. And then go apply for something else because they're going to see that $15,000 credit card and say, oh, well, she on that. Uh, they still gonna say, okay, well, we'll give her twenty thousand. Right. You see what I'm saying? So that's two ways: either slowly build it by you, your activity, or authorized user account. I've seen several of my customers do it because I had a customer um, from Texas. He ended up getting on his son's um, credit card fifteen thousand dollars as an authorized user. Mm -hmm. Then he turned around and got on his friend's Navy Federal account, but the friend had a credit card with Navy Federal. And when he first went, now this was a guy that didn't have high limit credit card, and he still had charge offs. We were still working, and he mm. went and applied for this, right? Mm -hmm. We still working on. He had some collections, and he still had some charged off accounts on his credit, and they gave him an eleven thousand dollar credit card with charge offs and collections. Yeah, them authorized users come in handy, but then that's another way of having a trade line without having to purchase it. Yeah, especially if you got a really, really, really mm -hmm. good friend or. Mm -hmm. A family member. He said he needs to get on that side. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so let's uh, let's touch on business credit. Okay. But that's something important too. That a lot of people have no idea how to even start generating business mm -hmm. credit. I mean, of course, you know about personal credit. You go apply for a personal credit right. card. That business credit runs a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Let okay. Say I'm a a new client. I got my LLC. Mm -hmm. You know, I got my EIN because you're gonna need your EIN right. for that. Where do I start? What's recommended? Where Where do I start? I'm starting from ground zero. I'm like, mm -hmm. man, I have no business credit whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So where, where do I start at? Well, first you want to make sure your structure is correct to get business credit. Okay. To be have because when you're doing business credit, you're not getting it just to start with the start of vendors. Mm -hmm. You're getting business credit because you're trying to build it. I'm sure over years and build a strong profile. Uh -huh. So it's certain things you want to have in place as far as the address, the phone number, the email address, everything needs to be professional. Now, the address. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't sit around and use my home address. Huh? Well, I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> have people been able to get business credit with the home address? Yes. Now, as you move further along in business credit, if I'm a lender and you got eight employees, all I'm working at your house, Mm. So you do better setting everything up the right way. Not just that, unless you're going to be at your house the whole time you have your business. Like you're in your home now, but what if you and your wife decide to move to another location, right? Right. Then you got to go change that address on everything. Secretary of State, IRS, Dun and Bradstreet, your business check accounts, checking accounts, um, any other, um, uh, all your... Uh, business credit uh, vendors or accounts and all you right. got to go change all of that because you use your home address and not a commercial address or a what we call a virtual address so I don't use my home address mm -hmm. but I have no building of my own mm -hmm. so would you recommend let's say Regis that's a virtual address Okay. And I only really recommend, I'm giving y'all this free information that people pay for. Okay. Ooh, well, I'm, I'm draining it out of <laughs> So, Regas, Da Vinci, or Opus. But all of my virtual addresses are with Regas. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. How much are they? 
It just depends. So yeah. the virtual address is based off whatever contract. When I first started with my virtual address here for six months, it was thirty nine dollars and twenty cents. Now, when I signed up for Sam.gov, I couldn't just have a virtual address, so I upgraded it to a suite, but oh. it's not like a full suite. Um, and I upgraded it to that, so I can have a office number, a suite number. Okay. Right. Um, but um, other than that, it just depends on what kind of contract you sign. Um, the person that I use here is a guy named Tim Green. He's in the office here, but I also have a another contact of a girl in Dallas that I use, where she can help anybody, you know, all over the nation get uh, a virtual address. And with my clients, they just do everything over the computer. So you got your business address. Mm -hmm. So you're probably going to need a business phone number, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Listed on 411. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it was something else. Oh, yeah, your business email. Yes. Not hotgirl69 at gmail.com. We do not want to see PookieMain23 <laughs> at yahoo.com. Now, you was PookieMain at 18. You're a businessman now. You be PookieMain at home with your family and your friends. Not on your email address. It needs to be professional. That makes a difference. If I'm a lender, I'm gonna give you, you telling me you want $150,000, and I'm Shanae Brown, Bookie Boo Woo, at Yahoo.com, I'm gonna say, I don't know. So it's just about being professional. That's another reason why you want everything settled like that. It makes you look like a bigger business.